Welcome to the second video in the series on OWASP Top 10 for 2017. And A2 is broken authentication. And like injection, which was A1, this has not moved position since 2013. So this is still considered the second most serious vulnerability in web applications. Now, if you look back at 2013, what you'll notice is that it was called something slightly different. It was called broken authentication and session management. And that wording was slightly confusing because what it was trying to say is either the authentication itself is broken or the session related to authentication is broken. But it was quite confusing because it sounded like two vulnerabilities. It sounded like we were talking about authentication and about session management, but it is only actually about authentication. My previous video got that confused as well, so I apologise for that. But in this video, I want to look at authentication more specifically and how it affects our web applications. Now, this is the OWASP grid for the risk assessment for broken authentication. So it's pretty easy to exploit broken authentication because obviously in most cases you could do it manually, but you can automate it as well. So it's pretty easy. It's fairly common and it's fairly easy to detect using a range of tools. And I'm going to show you one of those in a minute just to show you how easy that is to use. And the technical impact is obviously pretty high because if you can log in as somebody else, then in, in almost all cases, that's going to be pretty serious because that means you could potentially access anything on the site that anybody else would be allowed to, to see. So private data, admin areas of a website, things like that. So this is a fairly serious vulnerability, and that's probably obvious because we all know that authentication is, is what we use for security in the first place. So what are we talking about here? So we're talking about a user proving who they are. So obviously the first step in deciding what you can access, what you can see, what you can do is about proving that you are a particular user. Now it's worth just mentioning that this is not necessarily a human. It could be another machine and another computer that has electronic access to a system but we won't kind of really worry too much about that except just to, to be aware of that. And quite clearly, if the system isn't implemented correctly, then the underlying problem here, the underlying risk is that the attacker can impersonate anybody else. And because this usually involves cookies, which are simply text files, which we can have a look at quickly on one of the sites, that provides an easy way for an attacker to at least attempt to break authentication and the session ideas related to authentication and how the two things are linked together. And if the, the coding isn't done correctly, then there are a number of things that could happen. It, you could either trick the authentication system, but in some cases you also might be able to bypass it. So there are a couple of different ways that you might try and abuse authentication, but really the, the underlying problem is still the same. You get elevated permissions or you get to basically do whatever you want because nothing is being enforced correctly. And one of the particular vulnerabilities that's still the case, even if your code is written correctly, is the idea of somebody trying to brute force access to a particular account or to use something called credential stuffing, which simply means that credentials, usually emails and password combinations, are stolen from one site and then used to attempt to gain access to another site. And because emails are very often used <clears throat> as usernames and because people often use the same password across multiple sites that can be pretty effective to an attacker. Now, In terms of how common it is, so we said it's it's fairly prevalent, maybe it's not in every single application but <clears throat> particularly in uh, older applications based on older frameworks then there's a very good chance that there is some kind of vulnerability in authentication. And obviously anything you write from scratch or based on a, a very, very uh, kind of basic framework like Drupal where you haven't used a pre-built library and you've 
effectively written that code yourself there's obviously a danger that you've not you know thought of every different attack vector every different vulnerability that's related to authentication so that's kind of the the main place where you would find it of course the the problem with saying this is we have many old applications that we still use in businesses that we can't simply just go in and modify and we can't easily replace them with something else so although this might seem like an, an obvious point it's not always very easy to know what to do with that most modern frameworks that that are used for web design that have you know high level features and stuff are generally secure by design so .NET's authentication kind of works out of the box and pretty much uses all of the best practice as do most of the modern php frameworks and i'm not not sure about others but i'm pretty sure that the latest kind of python and, and ruby and stuff uh, is all going to work really well of course the big but is if you've extended or replaced any of this functionality if you've modified it for a particular reason obviously you might break things so that's the danger that that you can use a modern framework and still have broken authentication and one of the the biggest problems with authentication used in the context of the web especially since application level authentication is not really built into the original idea of the web it's something that got tagged on so it's very easy to get confused about what's happening. Uh, I mean, if you've ever tried to understand authentication cookies and trying to wipe cookies and change them and update them and everything else, you'll find that it's actually relatively complicated. So the danger is you think you understand what you're doing when you modify something, but actually you don't understand it quite well enough. And then you could obviously cause a vulnerability. And as I mentioned before, that, that some things are not broken necessarily, but can still be vulnerable to some kind of either denial of service attack or a credential stuffing kind of brute force attack where somebody's simply trying to find uh, correct combinations. So we're going to look at an example. I'm not actually going to look at credential stuffing per se because I don't have a list of uh, you, um, of emails and passwords obviously if I was a real attacker, attacker I either already have that or I could potentially buy those kind of lists off the dark web so I'm going to show uh, effectively the same technique but using a, a single account that I'm targeting rather than um, rather than email and password combinations so obviously the way it works is slightly different I pick a single username or single email and then I run through loads and loads of different passwords so we're just gonna have a look at that a second so in here I've written again a little kind of noddy application so this is pretty much an, an out-of-the-box .NET Core web application and the only thing I've added to it is the authentication now in .NET kind of earlier versions before .NET Core, .NET Framework, MVC and web forms, when you added identity, you actually got a, a load of code. So you got to, you know, very heavily customize that and to, you know, to kind of do what you wanted. In .NET Core, they've kind of gone away from that model a little bit. So although you have options to set, all of the code that actually does this work and the redirection, everything else is all built into a library that you get from a NuGet package. So if you go into the solution and look for the code, you won't find the code. You'll just find a reference to the, the login. And in this case, I have a single user account, which I put in as Luke at example.com. And the password I've used is password one, two, three, exclamation mark with a capital P at the start. Fairly common kind of password. If I log in, you'll notice I get redirected back to the home page and it says hello lukeexample.com if i try and log in and i get it wrong let's say luke at example.com if i just type in some rubbish you'll notice instead i stay on the same page identity account login and i actually get this little message here so i haven't written any of this this all just kind of works but i've only got that single account and it's using local db which is basically embedded sql server and I'm hosting that locally on this machine. So I've set up an IIS website and given it kind of a URL. So there's nothing particularly magic here. It's just a very, very, very simple website. But imagine that this was the basis for one of your web applications. So let's imagine you've got an important site. You've kind of built in the .NET Core 
authentication and you're kind of looking at this thinking wow it looks great it works it's got everything i need it's got forgotten password and all the you know register and stuff so i don't really need to change it i'm just going to live with that thumbs up you know we're doing well but let's see how an attacker might try and attack this website so here i'm running um kali linux which is kind of the go-to uh, Linux distribution for doing pen testing and hacking and stuff like that. Of course, it's used by good people and it's used by bad people. So there's there's no way you can really protect against that. But if you're actually serious about pen testing, about understanding these things, it's great. It has tons of applications pre-installed for just about everything that you have or haven't ever heard of. And there are even multiple options, really. So there's an application called Potato which can be used for what I'm doing. There's also, if you burp suite, we have the community edition installed, but if you use the professional one, there's something called Sniper on that, and Sniper allows you to basically do the same kind of thing, brute force, password attempts. But I'm using something called Hydra. So Hydra is a kind of multi-threaded, basically brute forcing application. It can attempt to brute force FTP and SSH and any one of a number of things. But I just want to show you a, a simple example of how I've used it to attack my site. So I've written a little script here. And don't worry too much about the details. But effectively, I'm going to access that login page that I was just looking at using curl. And I'm doing that, first of all, so I can keep the cookie locally and use that for getting data out of. And then I'm also going to take the results I get back from there. I'm going to find the request verification token. So most forms now will have some kind of cross-site request forgery token in them. So I find that using ORC and print out basically a, a lump of, of text, which includes the text verification token. And then using cut, I take off the double quotes to, to find the value and I store that in this variable. Then I do something similar and I basically take the contents of the cookie and this time I'm looking for something that's called .aspnetcore.antiforgery and the backslashes are because this is a regex and it takes the uh, pipes out to orc so orc can take the seventh column which is the value and then I do the same thing again but I take the sixth column which is the name of it and the reason I'm doing that is because uh, this has a slightly different name every time. So as well as kind of ASP.NET core uh, anti-forgery, it will then have dot and a little random number on the end of it just to make it a bit harder to guess. But obviously nowadays it's pretty easy to get that as well. And I dump that in session name. Uh, ignore the proxy. I was just using that while I was testing some stuff. That's commented out. And then really we've got a fairly simple one-liner. I mean, Hydra isn't the easiest tool to use. It's very command line oriented. There is a desktop version that you can use, but I haven't tried that. And effectively here I'm saying, well, let's just use a single username. So if I had a list of password and user pairs, I could pass in a list of usernames and then a list of passwords. And I can tell it whether to loop round the users and try all the passwords for all the users, etc. But in this case, I'm just going to go for a single user and then pass in a list of potential passwords. Now, in order to make this work in a reasonably short time, Fast Track has 222 passwords in it. And one of them is the correct password, which I've made sure is in there just to just to make sure it works. And then there's some kind of switches. That's the name of the account, which I've set up in my hosts file because this is inside a virtual machine. HTTP post form is the module I'm using. So rather than a form using get, it's a form using post. And then this strange syntax where you have the page, then a colon, then the kind of query string kind of form encoded values here up to there then another colon and then I'm telling it that success looks like a response that contains location colon forward slash in other words it's going to redirect to a success page in this case I also have to pass a cookie to make sure the session gets passed back in and that's to work with the request verification token and everything else. So it's a fairly straightforward kind of script. Um, I've just put that in here. And if I run that script just from my command line here, you'll notice this is running 64 
tasks at a time. So basically in a very short time, that's taken a, about seven seconds or something. And it's successfully found that the correct password is password one, two, three, exclamation mark. So I'm not sure whether this is running as fast as it will ever run. It seems relatively slow, but obviously it's got to wait for the web application to respond before it knows whether it's been successful or not. So possibly this could run quicker. If I had a whole load of botnets across the internet that I was controlling, clearly I could spread all of this work out across them. But you can see it's relatively quick to check 200 passwords. And earlier on, I tried a larger set of possible passwords and it took about 30 minutes to try 50,000 combinations. But the interesting thing to note is that at no point did the application say, oh, hang on a sec, what's going on here? There shouldn't be this many failed logins. So that's kind of, you know, what an attacker is going to do. Obviously, in most cases, they're going to be anonymous. They're going to try and use someone else's compromised machine. But even though the application I've got is coded correctly, even though it works, effectively it's already broken and it's, it's vulnerable to either credential stuffing or kind of targeted attacks so oop, shouldn't have pressed that should i so how do we fix it well we'll look at actually a, a kind of a, a simple way of fixing the specific problem with credential stuffing the the first kind of thing we need to understand is that as far as possible if we use a modern framework when we develop our applications when we're talking obviously about a framework that's been heavily used and tested in public so your drupals and your yees and your dot net and your various flavors of Java and Node and all these kind of things, then that's obviously going to be the best start that you're going to have. Obviously, if you've got a heavily modularized framework where perhaps the authentication isn't built in but comes from a third party, obviously you should be a bit more careful about that. But by all means, Google, whether anyone's ever kind of pen tested it or whether it's been certified by somebody, prefer a framework that has this built in like your, your .NET and your YI and stuff like that where it's kind of maintained by the core uh, framework developers and obviously that's you know there's a very good chance that that in itself is going to be strong enough for kind of side channel attacks for uh, for cookies and stuff like that because one of the things that I didn't show here was if I just pop this developer tools uh, back into <laughs> dock to the bottom so if we look at, say, this site here and we look at storage, we can see the contents of these cookies. So obviously, if I there's a um, if I actually log in, let's just log in a second. Hit the caps lock. If I log in and it returns back to the front page, you'll notice that I actually now have uh, an auth cookie. Now, the contents of this on .NET are basically encoded and encrypted using a machine key. So it's not a, a five second job to try and modify that. But because this cookie lives in the browser, obviously I could go in here maybe as Luke at example .com, And then I kind of, you know, try and do something here to change that so that then when I go back home, I try and get to, you know, become admin at example .com. Obviously, what's happened here is it's detected that this data is now invalid and it knows that I'm not logged in as anybody that it knows. So .NET kind of has that built in, but on older frameworks, again, there's a danger, especially if somebody's brewed this themselves, that if this is just base64 encoded data, they can change that and effectively impersonate any other user. So that's the... Um, that's why we should use modern applications. If you do have an old application and you can't rewrite it, there is a chance, but you have to be a bit careful, obviously, that you can copy and code from a newer framework. So, for example, uh, the PHP framework introduced some password hashing functions in version 5.7, possibly. And at that point in time, because it was still PHP and they were still based on code that existed in earlier versions of PHP, you could actually backport some of that code into an older application that didn't support the password hashing functions. So you could get the same level of security, the same configuration, but in an application that, that can't do it directly. So obviously backporting is one kind of option. One thing to particularly be mindful of is your password hashing algorithm. So 
one of the dangers of any kind of broken authentication, obviously, is if you can get in and find data, then you're going to end up finding potentially either weak hashed passwords. So that happened with LinkedIn, where they weren't using a very strong password hashing algorithm. But also some sites like the Rock U break uh, breach happened and all of the passwords were stored in plain text. So that was a, a kind of a disaster. So obviously you should know what password hashing algorithm you're using and you should try and make it a strong one and, you know, ideally make it updatable as well. Because actually part of good authentication is using a slow algorithm. And we'll see that with rate limiting in a minute on the application. But in terms of the actual login process, if that login process can take half a second, well, that's acceptable to a legitimate user, but that's going to slow down an attacker massively. So that slowness and being able to make it slower as your server gets faster is kind of really important. A general thing with cookies is setting the HTTP only flag in most cases, which means script can't read the contents of the cookie, especially if your site's vulnerable to cross-site scripting. You don't want a dodgy script getting injected into your application and reading the contents of an auth cookie. And make sure you set the secure flag. Probably your sites now are all HTTPS. And if they're not, they should be. Set the secure flag on that. Uh, on the cookies so that then they can't ever be sent over HTTP and subject to kind of man in the middle. And the kind of a, the last of the kind of the general how do we fix it is to use a combination of independent penetration testing and code review. At the end of the day, as a developer, I don't feel that I know enough about pen testing and possibly code reviews to know that if I've written something that I've written it well. So to pay somebody couple of thousand dollars for an application that you're hoping going to make you hundreds of thousands of dollars seems like a good investment to me to get somebody as you know a certified pen tester who can say we've tested it with all the known vulnerabilities and you know you've written it properly uh, hi highly recommended i've i've done that before now in terms of how to fix it in for sites where maybe the actual code implementation is already fairly solid and works pretty well, but that you're still vulnerable to things like the brute forcing attack that I just demonstrated earlier, would be to use something like rate limiting. So I have in my example, because it's going to be different for every example, I found some rate limiting middleware which I've got from uh, from GitHub, which I've now plumbed into my my bank account application. And I'm just going to publish that and show you what happens. <clears throat> now, the idea of rate limiting is it kind of works slightly differently depending on what, what rate limiting module you're actually using. But the general gist of it is you can set up rules that say things like you're not allowed to so um, submit more than X number of requests over X period of time. So you could say no individual IP address is allowed more than five requests in one second. Now, in this actual one that I'm using, you can stack those rules. So you could say, well, I'll allow you five in one second, but I'm not going to allow you more than 115 minutes. I'm not going to allow you more than a thousand in 12 hours. Obviously, you could configure those to whatever makes sense for your application, but you can effectively, you know, really, really throttle what's happening and then you can set usually what status code is returned so in this case it returns a 429 which is basically quota exceeded uh, you're, you're not allowed to, to access this too many times so now i have deployed that again if i just go back here just to prove that this still works uh, don't need that anymore now this is going to work locally anyway because i have an exception set in for 127001. So that should all still just work as normal. Hello, it's back at the home page. So that's all still working. So now if I go back to my Kali Linux again, um, just ooh, wrong password. And just go back into here. Let's have a quick look at the script again. So this is kind of important. So what's happening here is this is saying that success is marked by a response that contains location forward slash, in other words, a 302 or a 304. The backslash here is to escape the colon, uh, 
because Ra with a rather poor choice, Hydra has decided to use that as the delimiter for all of these different parameters. So I have to escape that. But basically, it's literally looking for this text in the response. Now, unfortunately, Hydra has very basic, uh, only has very basic ways of defining success or failure. You could invert it. So you could say failure equals when this happens. So you could say failure equals invalid password, depending on what your site does. The subtlety, as we'll see now, is in what happens when things don't work quite as you expect. So we've set this to say success is when it redirects. So I'm now going to run that same script again uh, against now something that's rate limited. Now, what's happened here is interesting. It says it hasn't found the valid password, even though if we scroll up, you'll see somewhere up here, it does have uh, the proper password uh there so it has it looks like it's attempted password one two three splat but it hasn't worked why is that well because when it tried password one two three splat it didn't get a 302 redirect it got a 429 quota exceeded so as far as hydra is concerned that wasn't a successful login now of course there's a bit of a problem there because if we know that the site is rate limiting and we kind of go, well, actually, that's not really going to work because it's not actually going to send us a location. Um, so I could try and kind of turn it around the other way and say, well, fail happens when you get um, invalid. Uh, oh, Let me see what it actually says. Let's go back to here. If I just try and log in as anything, it says invalid login attempt. So if I put that in there and say, well, if I see invalid login attempt in fact failures are default so let's take that back now what happens if we try it again now what's happened is we've got a different failure now this thinks that this is a valid password why does it think that well because when it sent this in and got back uh, the quota exceeded message that quota exceeded message didn't include the text invalid login attempt it would have instead just said you know quota attempts exceeded or whatever so it thinks it hasn't failed so if you can understand you can ask whether success happens by some kind of message or response you can ask or you can tell it that failure happens with a certain message or a certain response but the problem is as soon as you turn on rate limiting you completely break hydra because it has no way to kind of say something like only process this if it comes back with a 200 response or only process this if it's a 304 it doesn't have that flexibility which kind of means that already we've actually stopped um stop this stop an attacker from working now they could use a different mechanism they could use uh, like potato is one of them which allows you to be more specific but i actually struggled getting that to work because where I was trying to say, you know, exit if you get a 302, it was getting a 302, but it wasn't exiting. So I wasn't quite sure why that was happening. Um, so I couldn't get that to work. And because I only have Burp Suite community, I can't try that either. So in general, you can understand that even if you could code Hydra to pay attention to the rate limiting, effectively, this is going to massively, massively slow it down because those... 50,000 attempts I made when rate limiting was switched off according to the rules I've got set would take you five weeks before the system would actually let you from a single IP address anyway it would take you five weeks to actually be allowed to try 50,000 different combinations so just by something really really simple and in most cases, it might either be included in your Apache or your Nginx or your IIS. You might have it built in. But otherwise, you can probably put in a module at code level just to say, look, if these things are failing, um, I'm going to slow it down. <clears throat> if I'm getting too many requests from the same IP address, whatever those requests are, then I'm also going to slow it down. So that's a really, really simple way of uh, fixing it. Consider blacklisting weak passwords. Now, this is a bit of a tricky subject because every password that's ever been leaked is a weak password. So if you take that ROCU list, that ROCU list contains 
14 million passwords, I believe. So if you blacklisted all 14 million of those because they're in a known list, some people are going to take an awful long time trying to choose a password and you're going to say no, 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 no all the time. And there's a good chance then that if they don't need to sign up, they'll think, you know, let's forget this. Let's go somewhere else. So it's a little bit of a controversial subject. But in one sense, if you are using email addresses as the the username, then probably you do need to do that. And you need to say to people, look, the only way you're probably going to get a password that works is by using a password manager. Is all of that extra work worth it? That's up to you to decide. The password reset process is also significant because it is possible sometimes to break into an account by exploiting the weakness of lots of reset processes. So if in the same way you can attempt logins, you could att attempt password resets, especially if they don't require an email click. Then uh, and let's say the reset process involves answering a security question. Well, it might be a much easier to go through lots of possible security answers than it is to go through lots of passwords. So you need to consider your reset process as well. Multi-factor authentication, whether it's email, SMS is not great because it is breakable, but it's better than nothing. Um, two factor kind of um, what do you call them TOTP codes like Google Authenticator and stuff can be pretty cool if, you, if your users have, have your app on their device as well you can use that to get keys be very careful consider how they're going to reset that if they lose their device because that can be a, a massive problem if you don't have any kind of help desk or whatever and then, uh, you know, another kind of low level check, really, this should be done in any new frameworks. But if you've written the code yourself, check that session IDs are regenerated after you log in. And that's just to avoid what they call a, a session fixation attack, where somebody can effectively impersonate a signed in user by stealing a session ID and the system kind of going, oh, yeah, you know, I know who you are. You're that logged in user. So be a bit careful with that. Check that auth tokens are correctly invalidated. So particularly with single sign on solutions, when somebody logs out, are the auth tokens getting invalidated on the server. So somebody else can't sit there trying to guess a previously valid auth token, even though the real user thinks they've logged out. So check that they have invalidation dates and that they're, they're correctly deleted or, or whatever you need to do. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, user IDs instead of emails can be more secure because if I've stolen an email and a password from another system, that's not really much use. If you require a user ID and you don't allow a user uh, and you don't allow an email. But again, you've got to try and balance how much extra work this is going to be when a user comes back to your site and they can't remember the user ID. Is that going to be a problem? Are they just going to leave your site and go somewhere else? But obviously that makes it more secure because then the credential stuffing attack is much, much harder, especially if the user IDs are not formed in an obvious way. So there's just some of the ways to fix it. You know, top line, I guess, use the modern frameworks, use pen testing and code review. If you've got some money, use rate limiting. They're, they're kind of your, your three kind of big, big top level ways of fixing this. And again, just in finishing, please read the top 10 publication. It's available online. Search for OWASP top 10. You'll find the link to a PDF in a number of languages. And there's you know a number of more details in there than I have in this presentation. But any questions or comments, please put them below. I will be submitting more of these videos, but please remember they do take time for me to put together and especially the examples and the demos take some time. So I will try and do them as quickly as possible, but uh, it's probably going to take a good few weeks to get the rest of them up. So thank you very much and I'll see you in the next video.